Welcome, friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests. A special thanks, first off, to the Oregon Dental Association for the use of their beautiful facility. Thank you very much. Today we will be discussing the medical management of caries, the silver nitrate and fluoride varnish protocol. Speaking this afternoon will be Drs. D. Robertson, Steve Duffin, and Kyle House. Dee is a pediatrician who's worked with the Indian Health Service as the regional pediatric consultant and epidemiologist for the Pacific Northwest Tribes from 1982 to 2001. From his first month on the job with the IHS, he became concerned about the very severe caries in the primary dentition of the young Indian children he was seeing. Since 2001, Dr. Robertson has been the principal investigator for a number of caries prevention studies for young American Indian children. Since 2009, he's worked through a contract with the American Dental Association to organize and conduct three symposia on understanding caries in the primary dentition of young American Indian children. These efforts are ongoing. Dee currently resides in the Columbia Gorge Wilderness area with his wife, Julie, two dogs, and an indeterminate number of cats. <laughs> Steve is a general dentist who's practiced for 30 years. He was trained in microbiology at UCLA and completed his dental education at Emory University. Dr. Duffin's clinical focus has been in dental public health with an emphasis on care for children and adults with special needs. In 1994, he joined Capital Dental Care at the initiation of the Oregon Health Plan and continued there, finishing up as CEO and Dental Director in 2005. In 2005, he returned to private practice in Kaiser, Oregon to study the causes of increasing dental disease rates and to explore more effective therapeutic opportunities, especially in high-risk populations. More recently, Dr. Duffin is focused on teaching, research, and promoting the medical management of caries. He lives with his wife, Joanne, and their little Italian greyhound, Bella, in Wilsonville, Oregon. Kyle is a pediatric dentist who has practiced in Hood River, Oregon since 1999 and expanded his practice to Hermiston, Oregon and Pasco, Washington in 2009. Kyle has been active in the Advantage Dental Community since 1999 and currently is the chair of the Advantage Community Holding Company, LLC. Dr. House received his DDS from the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio in 1985 and then practiced in the Army until 1990 when he began his pediatric dental residency. Kyle also currently serves as Vice Chairman of the Board for the Oregon Child Development Coalition and is a consultant to, the, to Head Start for the Greater Northwest and Alaska. He lives in Hood River. Following the presentation will be a panel discussion. Joining Dee, Steve, and Kyle will be Dr. Mike Shirtcliffe, CEO and Dental Director for the Advantage Dental Companies, Dr. Marco Gutierrez, Associate Dentist at Shoreview Dental, LLC. Charity Ludwig, RDH, EPP, Director of Quality Improvement Advantage Dental. And Tiffany Kelleher, CDA, Office Manager for Shoreview Dental, LLC. Thank you and enjoy the seminar. So do you know any of these speaker type people that we're going to? This is Joanne Duffin. I think she forgot to mention the way she got the job. Okay, uh, my name's Dee Robertson. Said I'm a former IHS pediatrician with a really long-standing interest in this issue. And as a first speaker, I think it's important to always try to be uh, very mellow and low-key and, and not offend anyone, not be in anybody's face. And those of you who heard me talk before know that's my style anyway. So. Um, we uh, will be sure that no one leaves here unoffended after I finish. 
This is, is what I call a quick tour through a land of mythology, which is what I think we've been living in for the last 30 years that I've been working in this disease. So I'm a retired pediatrician. Um, my interest is um, really in the severe end of the spectrum of this disease. So I realize that in places like um, in a suburb of Vancouver, Washington, where my kids grew up, uh, caries just wasn't much of an issue. And many other parts in, uh, where we are right now, probably, it's not an issue. Uh, working on Indian reservations, and I'm talking about Northwest, Southwest, Northern Plains, Alaska, um, it's a problem. It's a problem of unimaginable magnitude and severity for many of you who haven't been there. Now, um, I do have a, a tiny financial uh, conflict of interest to, uh, to uh, admit to here. Um, about a year ago, when I first heard about Dr. Duffin, the uh, first word I got was um, someone had been to a meeting, and a colleague had been to a meeting, and they heard something about this guy, came kind of you know, wandering out of the woods from Oregon, as they say, on the East Coast, uh, and talking about using a new treatment called silver nitrate, and he was having great success. And I'd been working in the field for 10 years intensively and working with the best people in the country, some of whom are here right now. And I never heard about it. I had a lot of suspicion about this guy from the deep woods of Oregon. So I managed to contact Dr. Duffin and um, in one of the you know, great ploys, I got him to drive out to Hood River to meet me so I didn't have to drive into to Portland to meet him. Um, and he came out and um, so we talked a little on the phone and I told who I was. He said who he was, what he was doing and how good it was. And I said, do you have any data? And he said, he said, yeah, I have data. I'll bring data to show you. And I'm kind of a researcher type now. So I thought, okay, great. It's been a nice meeting, got to know each other, and Dr. Duffin said, well, let me show you the data. And uh, unfortunately, my laptop battery's dying, so you gotta look quick, you know, we got about 30 seconds to look at it. And so he, uh, he pulled it out and showed me this, and he's got all smiles and, you know, proud father and everything. He said, you know, so, so what do you think? And I said, I think you got a lot of yellow boxes and black boxes. Yep, but the yellow boxes are the bad guys, and the black boxes are the good guys. And you can see there's a lot more good guys than bad guys. So I said, uh, okay, uh, yeah. I said, I got a couple of questions maybe, like, you know, some things like this, you know, like what was the patient population selection criteria, age, cutoff, number of treatments, number of venerable, things like that. And um, <coughs> he uh, kind of looks at me and he looks back at this and reminds me of that great line from um, In the Heat of the Night with uh, Rod Steiger, a Mississippi uh, police chief, and he just arrested the wrong guy for the second time, and, and he's saying, but... I've, I've got the motive which is money and the body which is dead and that's enough for me. So Steve was like, I got the good guys and the bad guys and that's good enough for me. So anyway, I managed to talk him into letting me help him a little so we developed an access a database to um, a very easy for capturing data and some of the data we show later or in your handout packet will be from that. He owes me $67 and he hasn't paid yet. I've worked on it for about two weeks. <laughs> okay, myth number one, if there are enough dentists, i just let you read this. So John Zimmer's my hero in many ways and my inspiration. His pediatric dentist worked for close to 20 years now in the Northern Plains in very difficult circumstances. And uh, he said it all right there. We'll never drill and fill our way out of it. Who said that? Anybody? Who said that? Somebody famous? Come on, there's got to be some ADA types here. The president of the ADA said this uh, two years ago at a meeting on access. So uh, it's not just me that thinks that there's uh, an issue more of the um, amount of disease rather than the access. Uh, I'm going to run through a series of myths. These are things I've heard my whole career, especially in the last 10 years, about why we, if you're from Mississippi, you say we can't. We can't do anything about this because of the poverty. I didn't get this right. This is Suwana Regis Sekuder, this is Jay Wadden Regis Sekuder, places a little tiny isthmus called Elitibu Kalampumi, across a small lagoon from Kotekala, which across the big lagoon from Perikala, 30 miles south of Matakilabu, on the eastern province of Sri Lanka. Everybody know where we are now? <laughs> okay. Uh, wonderful, beautiful uh, paradise of a place. Um, these were great friends of ours. I was in the Peace Corps uh, over there. Um, and uh, I think you can see from here that the dentition, I was not a pediatrician, not a dentist, not interested in it, but I never saw a single child the three years I was there that had anything that looked like what I've seen my whole career here. And, and you probably can't notice from there, but this uh, Sawano's dress here is like 
kind of all ragged and tattered, and there's probably a third hand me down. These were just poor, poor, poor children, and their teeth were great. And yeah, their nutrition was good, but it's not the poverty per se. You just hear it over the time. Can't argue against the facts, D. The literature shows it's the poverty that does it. It's not the poverty that does it. It's the ramifications, implications of poverty in this country. Parents won't change their behavior. Oh, naughty, naughty. So, um, I know there's some academic types in here, and they love to read this kind of thing. It's the National Center for Health Statistics data brief, and they come out every month. It's the type of thing that people that like to read these will sit around and get a big cup of coffee and read all the vital statistics and see what Americans are dying from. And this one was especially exciting when I saw the, the headline for it. So, uh, these are the rates of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and diabetes in U.S. adults. Key findings are, what do you know, 45% of American adults have either hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, or some combination of those. Wow, that's almost everybody. And how do you avoid these? There's a point here, it takes a while, about 10 minutes for me to get to the point, but there's a, there's a point here, stay with me. How do, you, how do you avoid this? Okay, well, everybody knows. You avoid it by being a perfect person, right? Okay, simple enough. And whether it's hypertension or hypercholesterolemia or coronary artery disease, you avoid that being a perfect person. But it turns out there are about 104 million Americans who cannot be a perfect person. And for those people we have, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't get them all here. These are FDA approved medications for hypertension alone. There are more, I couldn't fit them all on there. This doesn't include the cholesterol drugs or diabetes drugs specifically. So for those of us who can't quite live up to what we maybe think we should, and if anybody should know what to do, it should be us, right? We've got to, the backdrop about 200 medications to help us, okay? So then we go to uh, carriers in the primary dentition. dentition. How many FDA approved products do we have with a specific indication of prevention of carriers in the primary dentition? I'm, I'm waiting for you to fill in the blanks. Okay, well there ain't none. But we've got this heart-wrenchingly, desperately poor situation these Indian children are living in and there are no medications available to help these children to not have ravaged dentition. But hey, what the heck? I mean, you know, we can't do anything because the parents won't change their behavior. But we've got these. So pretty subtle point. I don't want anybody to miss this, but uh, I started to do a slide with a big capital H for hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy. Okay, this one happened close to here, close to home. Rule number one. We all know this, right? If mom does all the right things, the baby won't get tooth decay. Rule number two. <coughs> okay. uh, the great majority of you would recognize the name of the person who's told this to me. I can give you names, date, location, meeting. She was probably lying. So what's the translation on this? The translation is, I I'm an expert, I understand everything about this disease, and as the world's greatest expert, I'm telling you, this can't have happened, what this mother was saying, and the baby have tooth decay. It's just wrong, wrong, wrong. We've got lots of examples. Talk to people in this room that work in Indian country. They'll tell you there are lots of examples, but that's been the mindset. <coughs> this one I usually say is just so insulting. I've heard it over and over and over. I used to say it's so insulting, I don't even bother to discuss it, but um, this is the, um, first child, a wonderful lady was my secretary about 10 years ago. I, I made the mistake of kind of offhandedly saying we should call her the bad hair baby and later on she was known for a long time as the bad hair baby and developed a personality to fit with her hair I might say. Um, so the mother of the bad hair baby came to me when she was about eight months of age and said, Dee, I'm having a hard time with my pediatrician. And I was like, well, okay, that's between you and your pediatrician. I'm not your baby's pediatrician. Yeah, he wants me to start juice. And I've heard your lecture so many times about this and too much sugar and giving a lot of juice and everything. I'm afraid to do it because I don't want my baby to have tooth decay. And, and can you talk to my pediatrician? I said, no, I can't. Listen to your pediatrician. He's right, but just do it in moderation. But a wonderful example. Here's an Indian mom, pure blood Indian from one of the Northwest tribes, so concerned about her baby's teeth. She wouldn't want to follow her pediatrician's recommendations for, for giving a little bit of juice at eight months of age. 
Okay, that's sort of a little trip to fantasy land and mythology back to reality. And what are these diseases? They're all infectious diseases. It used to be common not only with Indian children, but children all over the country 40, 50 years ago. You know, some of us are old enough to have lived through this without protection. Indian kids don't get those now. Almost nobody in the country gets any of those diseases. A few little outbreaks here and there, pertussis in Seattle. But for the most part, Indian kids don't get those. It carries as an infectious disease, and it is rampant and widespread. Okay. How do we eliminate all of the other pediatric diseases? Speak up, anybody. Immunization. Immunization is the word I was looking for. Okay, sorry, I couldn't hear the other one. Okay, now, I see people nodding off already. Um, anyone here, anyone here who's not a pediatrician and has not been to this show before, I've got a Starbucks coupon card here if you can tell me the difference between an immunization and a vaccine, and no, I'm not kidding. If you're not, let's say, let's start with no physicians, but certainly no pediatricians, and nobody's seen this show. What's the difference between a vaccine and an immunization? Anybody? It's a real card, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Come on, somebody's got to like Starbucks. I don't like to go in there with people packing heat in Starbucks, but... The vaccine be the product and the immunization be the process? Yes! You, it's the winner. Thank you. I'll, I'll fix that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so what's the, uh, what's the point? <laughs> there is a point. <clears throat> a vaccine is a product developed, we'll take just in general numbers, uh, 10 or 20 years of basic research, 10 years of applied research, 10 years of clinical research, approved, you have a product, vaccine manufacturer makes it, control conditions, they store it just right, they then ship it out to distributor, it goes out to the medical offices, so you keep it just right, and then you're going to deliver this to the child where someone knows how to deliver it, whether it's sub-Q or intramuscular. And then when the child gets that, the immunization occurs if everything works right. Okay. So you had the vaccine itself. What do you call all that stuff between when the manufacturer made it, came out in a vial, and they put it in their own storage? What do you call all that stuff from there up until the child gets immunized? It's a big term. Yeah, this is too hard. Public health infrastructure. This is what we do. We're all public, most all of us are public health people, right? You're, la <coughs> you're, you're laughing, am I right, Eli? Eli? Yeah, yeah. It, it's right, it's public health infrastructure. We've got that, okay? So we've got the public health infrastructure to control all the other diseases. We have it for prevent carries in children. What do we not have? We, we don't have the, the technology. We haven't had the technology, and that's been the missing piece. So we've been blaming everything else. The fact is we haven't had the technology really to control this disease in the children who need it the most. Why not? I think it's because it was, as the Surgeon General said, it's a silent epidemic. It's a minority population. It's not a big problem for lots of other people. There hasn't been a lot of interest in it. Any hope for the future? Yes, stay tuned about 15 minutes if I can wrap it up. Okay. Um, so as a result of the symposia, I apologize, I had some brochures out here. There have been three symposia sponsored by the ADA over the last four years, specifically on the subject of caries in the primary dentition, Indian children. Uh, some really sensational people here, a lot of them are in the audience, uh, have been to these meetings. And um, these are the reports right here. So if you're really interested, pick up a copy. Uh, those are the last copies on the planet, and the ADA ain't going to print any more. So if you, if you don't want them, don't just take them as a souvenir. As a result of these, we started an organization called Quest, and the, the, the name itself, Quest, denotes what we're all about, quantifying, understanding, eliminating serial tooth decay. The name connotes kind of the missionary type aspect of this, going out on a quest, a long, hard journey trying to find a cure. I'm the chair of that prestigious organization, which as of yet has no funds coming in. Anyway, at the second one of these, Rapid City 2010, purpose to bring together some of the leading people in the country, people in the room, to talk about what are our knowledge gaps. Um, this is um, like real important because the starting point for some people and some organizations up until now has been 
there ain't no knowledge gaps. We understand this disease. It's just a matter of doing a better job of what we know how to do with the tools we have. That's just wrong. Um, when we don't have decent case definition or metric for assessing disease burden as opposed to counting DMFS, DMFT, we don't have a metric to assess effectiveness of interventions. We're still writing articles about mean DMFS change dropped by one or 1.2 and it was statistically significant and whoopee, isn't that great? It has very little relevance to whether the children need it most, the children with the most morbidity are being helped. We don't understand the microbiology. There's a gazillion things on the micro out there. As part of my quest work group, we've got the microbiologists talking about how can we really assess this in Indian country. Um, we're just beginning to talk about the role of possibly enamel defects, so maybe some of the children where the mom wasn't lying and doing everything right, they still get caries. Maybe they've got some enamel defects and the enamel's more susceptible to caries. And we haven't up to now had any effective products. And for those of you who think that the things you're using and we're using and I've been recommending and others have been recommending for the last whenever, uh, go back and read the review of the ADA last year of the non-fluoride products and I think that's depressing, wait till the review of, from the ADA of the fluoride products comes out at the end of this year or next year. Anybody wants to fight about these, we fight afterwards, okay, we don't have much time left. So the fact of the matter is we're almost starting from scratch with this disease. I'm talking about the severe end of the spectrum. I'm not talking about kids with mild caries, a D1 or D2 here or there, uh, the teeth exfoliate and nobody cares. We're talking about the children that have high level of short and long-term morbidity from caries in the primary condition. And if you don't see any of those, uh, find the people here, they're in Indian Health Service and the tribal programs and they'll be glad to give you a, a tour. Aha, enter Esteban. So this is when the guy comes out of the woods from Oregon and, and tells us what to do. I think everybody's mellow. I don't think anybody's offended, Steve. So. Thank you, everyone. I want to say thank you for coming. First of all, it's a wonderful turnout, and all of my my friends and colleagues. And you heard the call. I've been anxious to have this conversation with the dental community, and um, meeting Dee Robertson has been my inspiration <laughs> to really step out and share the message, and um, uh, thank you again for being here. Um, ultimately, today I'm here to tell you my story. Uh, what have I done? What have I learned? And I leave it to you to figure out where it goes next. Um, as Joanne mentioned, I've been involved with uh, public health for many, many years, involved with the Oregon Health Plan the day it opened, March 1994, and uh, was with Capital Dental Care, the largest DCO in the state for many years, uh, doing the best job I could to serve our citizens. And when I started out, I was spending most of my time in patient, patient care, and as the company grew and as the Oregon Health Plan became more sophisticated, less and less of my time was actually involved with patient care, not something that I was very happy about. Um, so about 2005, five, I hit sort of a crisis where I just was unhappy uh, professionally. I wasn't seeing patients directly. I was working really hard with many, many state programs um, and I wasn't seeing the results. We, heard, we all heard the Surgeon General's call about the silent epidemic. So in 2000, I knew it was coming. In 2005, I knew it was here. I could see it so, since we were involved with the Medicaid population, as Dee has mentioned, with the Native American population. This is just almost a different disease. It's just uh, amazing. And, and um, I was frustrated. And I decided what I need to do is go back into private practice where I can concentrate on this issue and not be distracted by state meetings and, and uh, politics and all this other stuff going on. So. I found myself driving around in the city of Kaiser looking for a dentist who had called me to um, have an interview about becoming a provider in that area. And as it turns out, there were no Medicaid dental providers in that zip code at that point in time. And so it was my mission to find someone who would join the team and serve the patients. And, and I found myself lost driving around. Um, and I came across this office with a for rent sign on it. And I wandered in the building and I saw this beautiful view of a lake that I didn't even know existed. And in that very moment, it came to me that I needed to stop what I was doing, do something completely different. 
And on that day, I fired myself from Capital Dental Care, and I became the provider that was needed in that zip code. And for those of you who have worked in this environment, you can imagine what happened the next day. And my dear friend Tiffany Keller is here, as well as Barbara Courier. Uh, they were with me when we opened that office, and we had 2,500 Medicaid children that had poor access to care prior to that assigned to our office. The first day the phone rang off the hook, we had patients waiting outside with emergencies in the morning. Within a month or two we had hospital cases backed up so far that we couldn't even get enough OR days to get ahead of it. So I purposely put myself in front of the avalanche so that I, I would um, hopefully be motivated to find some new um, solutions. And so this is my story about uh, that, that uh, journey. And by the way, there is my email, so um, if any of you want to communicate with me, uh, please do so. Um, we've put a lot of time into the handouts. There's a, a pretty robust literature in your handout about the topics that we're talking about, and I remain at your service to, to discuss this in the future if, you, if you'd like. So uh, this is a slide of a, a, a case that was a tipping point for me. This was... Um, uh, a child that we had taken to the OR to repair the damage of dental disease that occurred. And for those of us that are familiar with dental disease, if we look at this slide carefully, we'll realize that this is a repeat hospital case. And I don't mean to be critical of the previous dentist, because the failure of this case wasn't due to the lack of technical uh, expertise of the dentist. It was due to the fact that the solution didn't match the problem. We have been trying to do an engineering solution on top of a biological problem. This child's disease was out of control when they saw the first dentist, and it was undoubtedly out of control within months after release from the hospital the first time. So I knew that we had to do a better job. We had to do something differently. I didn't want this to happen anymore. Um, recently, uh, the New York Times, cover of the New York Times, uh, March 6th, had this article, many of you may have seen it, uh, carries rates increasing in children. And um, the entire country is being shaken up about this uh, new awareness of increasing disease rates in young children in this country. And this article in the New York Times uh, was preceded by this um, speech that was given by Senator uh, Bernie Sanders on the Senate floor. This report, which many of you have seen, uh, Dental Crisis in America, came forth from that. And there's a huge trickle-down effect in all of the media, et cetera. So we know that we've got a problem. Now, the Surgeon General warned us about it more than 10 years ago. It's in front of us. I knew it was coming in 2005, and it's here. And we've got to do something about it. I'm, I'm absolutely committed to uh, changing the course. So it, I guess the point is, that at that point in time, it was obvious that we needed a better way. I didn't know what it was. I thought when I went into private practice that, okay, I'm going to do more fluoride varnishes, I'm going to do more sealants, I'm going to do more chlorhexidine and fluoride, and I'm going to use the tools that I knew about, and I'm going to do it more effectively. Instead of having children coming in twice a year, I'm going to have them come in four times a year. I'm going to do this more aggressively, okay? And what I realized in a short period of time is doing more of the same things that don't work now are not going to make them work in the future. We needed to change our way of thinking about this disease, and perhaps it was because my professional background was founded in microbiology that this came to my attention. This is an infectious, bacterial, transmissible disease. We need to look at it that way and look for new solutions with that, within that paradigm. I'd like to introduce these three gentlemen who I came very familiar with as I began looking for solutions. This is 2005, 2006. The first um, individual on the upper left there is W.D. Miller. He was an American dentist practicing in Berlin in the 1880s. Uh, Dr. Miller is a remarkable individual. He pr published the book, The Microorganisms of the Human Mouth, which is a landmark scientific um, um, document in the dental profession. He proved, the first person to prove, that dental cavities are actually bacterial infections. Uh, Dr. Miller, in his spare time, was actually working in Dr. Robert Koch's medical li laboratory down the street from his dental office, and he was learning the techniques of medical microbiology, and he committed to himself that he would find the causative agent for caries, search for the bacteria. He grew lots of bacteria, he studied them under the microscope. Guess what? He never found 
the causative agent for caries. Have we found it today? No. But what Dr. Miller did realize is this is a bacterial transmissible infection. He began to look at antimicrobial solutions. Dr. Miller is the first person that I know of in the literature to specifically state that silver nitrate is an effective antimicrobial agent for caries. It's in his book published in 1890. I read it and it really woke me up. I then, as I looked at the literature, I ran across G.B. Black. We've all heard of him, of course. I had volume two and three in dental school 30 years ago telling me how to cut holes in teeth. I didn't realize that volume one existed. Well, it, logic would suggest that it does. And as I was pursuing the literature on dental cariology and epidemiology, this book was brought to my attention. And it was not easy to find. It was published in 1906. You don't have it in your library. It's not in most of the dental schools. But I assure you, it is a masterpiece. Again, The Pathologies of the Heart Tissues of the Teeth by G.V. Black, 1906 talking about the microbiology, the epidemiology. The chapter on children's dentistry from this textbook is a masterpiece. I go back and read it over and over again. G.V. Black first I, I, is the first minimally invasive pharmacological dentist. G.V. Black talked about using silver nitrate in precisely the protocol that I'm talking about in a hundred years ago. He described using silver nitrate to arrest caries, to allow the nerve to regenerate secondary dentin, to allow him to then place a restoration in the child's mouth atraumatically. This was before local anesthetics existed. Okay, G.B. Black told us all this a hundred years ago. Jump forward in time just a little bit to uh, Percy Howe, who was the founder of the Forsyth Institute, in involved with founding the, the, um, the uh, School of Dental Medicine at Harvard University. Dr. Howe advocated using silver nitrate to arrest caries aggressively between 1910 and the 1950s. In fact, the use of silver nitrate to arrest caries became so commonly used that it got a new name. It became known as Howe's Solution. Simply a silver nitrate used to arrest caries between 1910 and 1950. Remarkable story. Okay, what did these three people have in common? Silver nitrate. They're all talking about silver nitrate, either as an antimicrobial or directly as a caries arrest agent. G.V. Black, the founder of the, dentist, of the dental profession, talked about it in extensive detail in Percy Howe. Okay? Um, they described, described how to use silver nitrate, and the protocol is very specific. We use tiny, tiny amounts of silver nitrate to kill the bacteria in the curious lesion. You can see their microbrush applying, and I'll just show a video in a little while of how this is done. It can be done safely, effectively, and um, we have done thousands of cases. Dr. Gutierrez is here, my associate, and he's going to be on the panel discussion. We have collectively done thousands and thousands of cases of caries arrest. It's successful. It's enormously successful. So <clears throat> what's the story of silver nitrate from the 1880s to 1950? So why did we forget about silver nitrate? You know, I don't have the answer for that. I'm sure there's, there's multiple reasons. But it's astonishing to me that we had the answer to the current problem a hundred years ago. And we simply needed to be um, reminded about something that was sitting there, just dust off those old books. Silver nitrate is safe. Okay, I put a review paper by Pang et al. in your handout. It's the most comprehensive literature review on this subject anywhere in the world. There are a hundred literature references in there. This is safe. It is effective. I can tell you that many studies have shown it's effective. Remember, it was used to rest caries for 50 years. I can tell you as a clinician that it's effective. We use it every day as our first line of defense for caries. This is an FDA-approved product. It's been FDA-approved for decades. If you want to get silver nitrate, you know, you can order it from Henry Schein tomorrow. And I'd like to state that silver, silver nitrate used for arresting caries was the standard of care. Okay, we can get into discussions about whether doing this is the standard of care today, but let me remind you all, this was the standard of care between 1900 and 1950. So here's an image from G.V. Black's publication, volume number one, 1906. This image uh, right here, the upper right, is a photograph of a child with arrested anterior lesions from his book in 1906. I, I put below it an image that I took from a patient in my practice in 2011. Silver nitrate was the it was the agent for arresting caries in both cases. So we should speak for a moment about silver fluoride. It's an important subject. Silver fluoride, number one, is not available in the United States. It is not FDA approved. It was developed in the 1960s. It's been used extensively around the world. 
There's a remarkable literature about silver fluoride, silver diamine fluoride. Read the Pang article, the review article, it's really good. Okay? Been used in Japan, Australia, Brazil. Okay? There currently is a, an FDA 510K application pending for silver fluoride. Silver fluoride might come to America. I hope that it does. I've looked at silver fluoride in great detail, both in vitro and in vivo, and I think it holds great promise. It's not here. It's not here now. So why do I use silver nitrate? Because it's here, it's, it has a great history. It works, it's FDA approved, and the efficacy is, is, as far as I can tell, identical. So if silver fluoride becomes um, approved, remember, it will be approved as a predicate device, so as a uh, similar product to, to fluoride varnish. Fluoride varnish is approved for use in the United States for desensitization, not for all the stuff we use it for. We need to remind ourselves about that. Okay, so even if silver fluoride arrives, number one, it'll be more expensive, and it will be used as a predicate device. Silver nitrate is here today. How does silver nitrate or silver fluoride work? It is the silver ion. Okay, back to microbiology for a moment. The silver ion is what is highly bactericidal, and it's remarkable because bacterial cells have a net negative charge. Silver is, of course, a positive charge. Silver ion going toward a bacterial cell is like a cruise missile or a guided missile. Boom, it goes. It's so small that it penetrates the cell wall, gets into the cytoplasm, inhibits ribosomal function, DNA replicates, etc. It, it kills the cell. Silver ion is highly bactericidal, okay? And it is totally safe to humans. So let me talk a little bit about how we use it in our practice today. Okay, how do we use it? And we use it so that we can have happy uh, kids like this. This is the medical manager of carries in my practice today. These are some images and things that I'm going to share with you that have come directly from, from my experience. Okay, number one, I want to remind everyone that this is one tool. Okay, it isn't the solution. As Dee mentioned, I don't think this is the solution. It's an important piece of our uh, tool chest. Okay, but we still need to emphasize primary prevention, dietary constraints, oral hygiene instruction. All of these things need to be in place. But when cavities develop anyway, we have another tool. I've gone around the state of Oregon for the past year uh, working with Advantage Dental, teaching dentists how to do this technique. And I ask the same question as I go around. What percentage of your pa new patients have active, active cavitated lesions? You know what the average number is I hear? 90%, okay? I visited a dentist in Lake Oswego, very high affluent practice, and I asked him the same question. What percentage of your patients in this community have active cavitated lesions? I expected him to say 10, 15%, 40%, okay? The disease is changing. The epidemiology of curies is changing. We need to realize that. We can't use the same old tools. So. Uh, to, to paraphrase once again, the medical management curious protocol is multifaceted, starts with a strong emphasis on primary prevention, and uses a combination of silver fluoride, uh, silver nitrate, followed by fluoride varnish when cavities do develop. So this is a combined therapy. It includes an antimicrobial component, that's the silver nitrate, with a remineralization component, that is the fluoride varnish. What I found is that when I put those two tools together, this is like um, enormously successful. So this is, how, this is how we use silver nitrate. There it is, there's the whole setup. And I brought, brought a tray over in the back if you wanna go look at it, okay? This is the simplest setup you can possibly imagine. We've got a, we could throw the Explorer away. I have a great video of my thro myself throwing my Explorer into the lake behind my office. <laughs> we need a mirror. There is a dap dish with one drop, one drop, okay? My son Marcus uh, measured one drop. That's 17 microliters. We can tell you how many atoms are in there if you want to. This is a tiny amount. One drop of silver nitrate with a micro brush will treat all the lesions in a kid's mouth. Six, eight, 10, 12 lesions we can treat with one drop. Okay, this goes a long way, it's highly potent. Then to the right of that we have the fluoride varnish to apply on top of the silver nitrate. This is the easiest possible therapeutic that, that we could imagine. So we're gonna go to a video, because I think you need to just move the cursor over to the lower left. There we go, and click that, and we'll play it. Okay, so this image is gonna show us applying silver nitrate and then fluoride varnish to a child with four lesions. This can be done in about less than a minute. 
But let me say that this is a technique sensitive process. If there is any saliva on the lesion, if there's any contamination, the silver nitrate will not get to the bacteria and kill them. So um, once again, microbrush with silver nitrate. Here comes the fluoride varnish. The last one is particularly interesting. If you look carefully, you'll notice that there is a little bit of saliva on the occlusal surface of that molar. And so the dentist and the hygienist or assistant whoever was doing this held back, got the air, air syringe in there, dry off that surface. There we go. We can see it a little better with the light. Now you can see it good. Now the, there goes the silver nitrate. It's going to wick right into that fissure system. It's going to kill all the bacteria that are living in that tooth. And then there's the fluoride varnish that goes on top of that, and we're done. So this kid had four lesions. We've stabilized them. And guess what? There's another thing that I've discovered in this protocol. These kids don't get new cavities. Not only do these lesions remain arrested for years, one reason I didn't talk about this is I wanted to make sure it works. Dee mentioned that awful spreadsheet. Well, yeah, it is some data, and we transported some of that data into a real access database that scientists can scrutinize, okay? But what we noticed when we put that together is these kids not only had their lesions arrested for years, they did not get new lesions. And that is, is mentioned in the literature on silver fluoride as well. So when um, we do have a cavitated lesion that we have arrested and the need exists to restore the tooth, okay, and we may have an aesthetic concern, this turns black. It's not pretty, okay? I understand that. We tell the parent that up front. Black is a different connotation in our practice, okay? But we can restore the teeth atraumatically. With time, I noticed that when I was getting the patients back to do the restorations, I didn't need anesthetic. If you go to my practice today, you see 50 kids, 50, 60 kids a day going in and to and out of our office. You will not hear any drills. You will not see any needles, okay? Do we never need those things? No, we occasionally do, but it's amazing how often we can restore this. this in this example, we have an arrested facial lesion on this anterior tooth that was anesthetic. Notice that there's a stainless steel crown right next to it that the parent didn't have any problem with at all, but that dark spot, that had to go. So that's fine. The lesion would have been arrested for two or three months, okay? Here it is, okay? It's arrested. We helped the parent understand that this is a scar, okay? We had an infection. We put medicine on it. The infection's gone. Now we have a scar, okay? You can either do nothing or you can fix it if, you, if it's an aesthetic or a functional problem. So in this case, all right, we went in with a small number six round burr, removed that black stuff, no anesthetic necessary, took about one minute to remove that, okay? And we put a glass ionomer in there, and now we have a restored tooth. Atraumatically, no anesthetic, child was happy, never had any pain, no shots, no needles, nothing. It's amazing, we do this all the time. What about for these large uh, cavitated lesions of the posterior? Well, um, in my view, a primary tooth is a space maintainer. Okay? It's there to have function and to save space for the permanent dentition. So when I see a child with decay in the primary dentition, I want to preserve the tooth so I can preserve the space. So in this case, we have these large cavitated lesions. They're totally rusted. They're food traps. We simply bond a glass animal on top of it. Okay? Glass animals will bond directly to silver-treated dental sur surfaces. These teeth are stable until exfoliation. How much plaque do you see on those teeth? Okay. It took me years to figure it out. Not only do they not have new cavities, they don't have any plaque. You know, one day our hygienist came to us and said, why are, you, why are these people in your recall system? They have no plaque on their teeth. Okay. I, there is an, a biofilm inhibition effect that we do not fully understand that I hope to learn more about in the future. It may, it may be more important than the carries arrest uh, benefit, actually. So how, is this used, or how has this changed my practice? Well. This is Italia. I'd like you to meet Italia. Italia is the most medically fragile patient I've ever seen in my practice. And again, I focus on special needs children and adults. Okay, Italia is a, had a spinal cord injury. She's on a respirator in a wheelchair. Okay, she came into our office, and Tiffany will remember this, screaming like a banshee. Now, <clears throat> when I heard that commotion, I came out with my headlamp, and I thought, well, good. She's yelling. I can look in her mouth. Guess what I found when I looked in her mouth? Decay in all of her molars, okay? Now, um, she was totally un uncooperative. How would I treat this patient in my practice? Well, in the old days, seven years ago, I would have considered taking her to the hospital for restorations. In fact, I decided to call the anesthesiologist at North Bank Surgical Center, where I did my hospital cases when I was doing that kind of work, to ask him if Atalia was a candidate for general anesthesia. Guess what he said? 
No way. We would not touch this child for general anesthesia. So how are we going to treat Italia? Thankfully, at that point in time, I discovered silver nitrate. We were able to go in and arrest the lesions in her mouth, and today she's curious free. It's been almost three years, and um, it's a great success story. So here's an example of a child that couldn't get any care at all unless we had a traumatic medically, medical management of curious. Okay. How did this affect my practice? I want to share some, some basic statistics with you. Okay? We can treat more people. We can treat them more effectively, atraumatically. That's wonderful. Okay? In this graph right here, uh, the top blue line represents the total number of patient encounters in the Shoreview Clinic from 2005, 2006 to 2011, five-year time frame. When we started off in 2006, again, we had 2,500 Medicaid children assigned to our practice. We had about 8,000, 7, pardon me, 7,000 patient encounters. A little more than two and a half, two and a half or so encounters per, per person per year. Not too bad, okay? Look what happened between 2006 and 2011. It went from 7,000 to 16,000 patient encounters, okay? How are we going to solve the access to care problem? Care for more people, okay? We're able to take care of a whole lot more people using the medical management of caries, okay? I used to have 15 patients a day in my office. Today we have 40. You can do that by this technology. The other thing that I want you to, to point out to you is that the bottom line, the, the, the yellow or orange line, represents the number of disease care appointments. So when a patient came in, we did a filling, a root canal extraction, something related to disease care. Okay, when we started in 2006, we had 7,000 visits and we had 2,000 disease care visits. That's 32% of the visits in my practice involved disease care of some kind. In 2011, Okay, that had fallen to 12%. So were we able to manage the disease? I think so, if the number of disease care appointments went from 32% to 12%. So this is statistics straight out of Easy Dental from my practice management software, okay? What happened to Shoreview Hospital cases? This is kind of an interesting trend, okay? In 2006, we started I noticed that there's a jump in cases, 2007, 2008, pent up demand, okay, could that be it? I'm not sure, but I think so. And then 2007, 2008, I'm learning how to use medicine to manage caries. Look what happened to our hospital cases. It went to zero. Okay, it went from having, not even knowing how to get enough OR days to get ahead of the problem, to having zero cases in 2011, zero cases so far in 2012. This arrest decay and eliminates the need to take many, many children to the hospital. This is not going to eliminate hospital dentistry. Okay, There's no question about that. There's need. Patients with medical conditions, we're still going to have to take people to the hospital. But we know today that the risk of general anesthesia is significantly worse than we ever thought it was. When I think back at the, the, the decades that I took to people to the hospital never even thinking about the risk of general anesthesia, I knew that something could go wrong. Now we know that young children who are exposed to general anesthesia are going to have cognitive problems going forward. So we have to be very, very careful about this decision to subject a child to general anesthesia. Okay. So what did these results tell us? We have improved access to care. We can see more people. There's no question about that. It works. We have more effective therapeutics. Okay, carries arrest works. Okay, it works better. Okay, the, the spreadsheet that D didn't like, 98% carries a rest. Okay, can you think of any restoration that has that kind of success over, t over time? No. Enhanced outcomes. Got ahead of myself. And this is able to be delivered at lesser cost. So we're living in a budgetary world where we have to do things more effectively. This can provide care to more people at a lesser cost. So I'd like to finish up with this famous quote from Gandhi. Um, we must become the change in the world we wish to see. So I feel like I've, I'm, it's time now to come out and share this message and to challenge us all that we can do a better job. And this may be a tool to help us accomplish that. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to turn the time over to Kyle House. And he's going to share some of his experience. And, and let me add that Kyle and I have been on a parallel path. We have been thinking about this. We've been strategizing. Hey, what works for you? What are you doing? What are you seeing? We've been doing this for five years. So it's a pleasure and a privilege to have Kyle here. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. I'm just a clinician. So, oh, what are, what are yeah. you guys? Uh, 
down, press down. Okay. Let's see if I can follow directions as a pediatric dentist. Uh, I'm a pediatric dentist. I, I treat kids alone, special needs adults. I live in Hood River. I've been here for 13 years. Um, I pardon the A on there. This is not to advertise any insurance companies. I just happened to present this last week to, to Greater Oregon Behavioral Health. And I didn't have time to erase any deals of not receiving any money. So those kind of fun things. But anyway, I, I am. I'm a pediatric dentist. I'm a Texas-born kid. Came up to UW. I uh, got my pediatric training. So I kind of got hooked on the Northwest. I like the water, the snow, and the wind. And so, of course, I stood in Hood River and stayed. And uh, since then, I've been working on kids, and I came up here looking for a reason uh, or a way or a methodology that I could do it. Um, I'd come out to Central Texas. I worked in a hospital-based system. I ran their oral health program for a very large group called Scott and White Hospital Systems and Clinic. Uh, there were 700 and some out of us as physicians that ran this big group across Texas, and we had a fully integrated health system. We were fortunate, and so I didn't see tons and tons and tons of decay. I was working on doctors, kids, nurses, kids, physical therapists, all that were in there, and then there were the Medicaid children. And then we had a huge carriage problem in Texas. We had a reduced fee-for-service program uh, that was there that basically only got paid if you picked up your handpiece. It was, there was no, no money or profit or, or ability to do your job unless you did something, because no one would do it. So what we've been shifting in here, and uh, if you guys have known uh, coordinated care, for those of you from Oregon, I don't know, is anybody here from Oregon? Because if not, I'm fixing it. Okay, good. If you're not from Oregon, some of this might be a little confusing. I'm going to use some terms here that coordinated care, basically uh, Affordable Care Act light is what we've done here in Oregon. So we've been working towards uh, global budgets. Um, after working here for a couple of years, I ran into this group, Advantage Dental. Uh, they were holding the Medicaid contracts. We had this Oregon health plan thing going on uh, that was new to me. They would put you on capitation. They paid you a thing, and then they told you what kind of outcomes they were looking for, and that was kind of cool because no one, no one ever asked me what I wanted to do. They just told me what I needed to get paid. Uh, so when I got into the Oregon and met uh, uh, Mike Shercliffe and his group over there, it was interesting because he says, I just don't want you to have kids with cavities. Here's a block of money. So it's a little bit of a change. And so I've been, I've been tasked with the, the how to make this work. I have been doing, oh, nice slide. <laughs> Steve's having me re repair things. I come back in and it kind of loop back into a circle of communication here. But what I found out is we had to find something to do different. When you're being paid on uh, capitation, which is a bad word, global budgeting is a new hot word, makes us feel all sexy. Uh, so we have a global budget because it's a worldwide thing. Um, what you have to do is you change your, your shift in how you do things. You really <coughs> want outcomes. No one's paying you to create a widget. That's one of the terms you'll hear around us if you're around us guys that do this is we're in a widget driven society as dentists and physicians. You get paid, you replace a knee, you get money. You drill on a tooth, you get cash. That's the way we've been done. That's not what we want to do. The whole idea is not have to replace, how do I teach you not to have to have knee replacement? How do I teach you not to get cavities? We all talk about that. It's really the beginning of our education. It's about prevention. It all starts with prevention, but we don't get paid for doing prevention. And so we don't necessarily focus on that. We focus on how good we get. So in, the, in dentistry, we became very, very good at engineering. Very good at engineering. And we try and teach you how to take care of our engineering because we're really good engineers. We can really build some cool stuff and our microscopes and all that kind of stuff. But that makes it hard on kids because I got to stick them with a the needle to do that. So I'm very good at it. I enjoy it. I have kids. I get a lot of high fives after doing that. It's not really good on dentists because it breaks your neck, kills your back, stresses you out. Every day you go to work, you're worried about people, you hear this more often. I don't hate dentists, I don't hate you, I just hate dentistry. That's a tough environment to work in. Uh, and then the payers, uh, if you're in the insurance business, you don't like widgets because widgets cost you money because you get money paid out. You gotta go pay people for doing that. So what we did is the system needed to be rearranged and we started that with our care. So what we've done, with global budgeting or capitation on that and how this works and ties into what Steve is talking about and what Dee's talking about is you're gonna pay people for the outcomes you wanna get. So I started experimenting with this in 2000, and, uh, I believe two, 2003, when I put myself on capitation plan with Advantage to take care of the kids. I currently take care of more than 10,000 kids on capitation plan in four clinics, three clinics in Oregon, one in, in Washington. And um, we get paid $9.86 a month. So that's what I get to do comprehensive care on, on kids. Not a lot, but it depends on how you look at it. If I feel like I have to go crown teeth in order to do it right, and that's the good outcome, then $9.86 won't pay for it. For those of you who do stainless steel crowns, that'll buy you like one and a half crowns. 
So if you put one and a half crowns on your out of money for that month, you let that kid kind of go cook a while. So you can't really do it. So obviously it's not driven on the restorative side. But if I can keep that kid from needing that crown, and I'll get to this slide in a minute, I actually got into how to make this work before I jumped on board with Mike and the group. I had to go down, I'm a business guy. So I put it in a spreadsheet and pulled some things out. I won't give you the spreadsheet, I'll give you the short stuff. Mm -hmm. But what this does is it rewards the provider provide access to care. The more people you have and the more people you can push through your system at the lower cost, actually the better that is for your system as a, as a practitioner. It is a shift in thinking from what we're doing. We're always about how many people can I put in the operatory to work on versus how many people can I pass through my clinic. Steve's graph of access to care, he did that without building a clinic. He'd have to go spend another million dollars, 600,000, 500, however big bet you want to do it. I don't know how much that clinic cost him to build. But when you go and look at clinics, we tend to think, and you hear about it all the time, is we need another clinic. We need to build another federally qualified health center, or we need to go build another dental clinic. We've got to get Kyle to put a pedo clinic on the coast because there's no pediatric dental care on the coast. So the expectation is that we have to go expend between 500 and a million dollars at a pop to provide access to care. When in actuality, we need to be more effective and more efficient in what we do. That part plays into how to make global budgeting or capitation work for you. It rewards the provider for being effective. The more people I can get in my system, the more people I can take in and take quality care of, the actually more that I get paid. I mean, that's a maybe a, a weird thought to a lot of people, but that's how that works out, is the less I expend by preventing the disease, and the better off I'm going to be, because I'm not locked up with a surgeon in a room with two assistants trying to work on one three-year-old. I can have a bay of eight hygienist like Charity, wave Charity, Charity's my, she's not my hygienist, I'm just going to try and steal her, um, but you, know, you have that and she can run a bay of six other assistants and hygienists and they can go and work on these protocols for a dollar a kid in 10 minutes versus me doing a surgical procedure for 45 minutes with a sedation and two assistants at about $250, $300 an hour is a lot cheaper than if I can go and run a whole bay for that. The system encourages long-term relationships because with capitation plans the way that we do it, those people are assigned to you. They're no different than your fee-for-service patients. Those guys show up, they're assigned. They're your patients. In the reduced fee-for-service model, people are not assigned. They come to you because you take it. You put it out and say, I treat OHP patients or I treat DSHS patients or whatever it is in your state. They come to you as long as you can take them. But at the same time, they're not your patients. They can go anywhere they want to. Kind of like it's a fee for service too. But if you build that relationship with them, but if someone's on a global budgeted system, they're assigned to you. And I'll have a story about that in a little bit, about the differences between my Pasco, Washington practice and my Hermiston, Oregon practice, which are 20 miles apart. Um, system encouraged providers to take care of acute disease. And what you got to get them in, you got to stop the fire. I think it's one of the things I had in there, unless you took that bullet out. Uh, you manage mild, you know, mild to moderate disease using medical intervention. This is the medical management carries program. You want to stop the fire. That's the thing I always talked about. If you don't put out the fire, someone's going to put a finger in the dike. We don't have one. I think it's more like D saying is we don't have something, if not had something for a long time, other than fluoridation. Fluoridation slows the process down, but obviously it doesn't end it or we wouldn't have carries today. It's a good medication for making the teeth more preventive. It makes them more resistant to the process, but it does not remove the medical condition. It simply makes it more resistant. You're in better shape before you have surgery. You usually recover from the surgery better, but it doesn't keep you from having the surgery if you're abusive to your body. So the same thing with this is you intervene and get that done. Then you have time to work on the disease process. Then you have time to do your restorative care later with a disease-free mouth, and you can do better quality care that's going to last longer as well. So those are kind of the models that you're looking at. Um, it allows me, I get a block of money, I can hire associates, I can build a clinic, um, I can hire more assistants, I can hire a, a hygienist that was, and I just lost my, she moved to California, I had a public health hygienist that ran around to all my cities and gave presentations to my classes, did home visits, visited schools, message, prevention, prevention message was always the same no matter where they went. And so I used my block of money that I got from the state and from Advantage Dental to hire a hygienist to go out and do, and that's what we do with Charity. Charity spends her time driving around the state, uh, we just need like nine of them, and teaching and preaching as I call it. Uh, and that messaging is part of the deal that you need to do. So by giving me a block of money, I have control over how I can spend it and what's effective in my community. Because what works in Hood River did not work in Hermiston. What worked in Hermiston is not necessarily working directly in my Eugene office. There's different personalities. Hermiston's a very Eastern Oregon conservative. It's easy. I got cowboys and cowgirls out there. I can sit there. I have no behavior management problems in Hermiston. 
but daddy don't lie. <laughs> we sit there, buck up, boy, get in there. And I go over to Eugene and, you know, no offense to anybody from Eugene, I have a clinic in Eugene, but uh, we, we weave a lot of flowers and we have a lot of hugs and sensing sessions to get through it. And so we do, we have a lot, we don't have 10 minute appointments in Eugene, we have 15 and 20 minute appointments in Eugene because the clientele that's there, it's how you get through. If I don't have a relationship with you as their parent, I can't get through the child. So it's funny, but it allows me then to adjust to that. I now have my budget. This is my budget, and I get to choose how I expend it that works in that area. How's the education work? How does the, the viability with the parents work? How do I get this message consistently? How to get the behavioral changes that I want after I've stopped the fire? The medical management part, like Steve and I, we were running on parallel paths, and if I were to go through my entire protocol, it is different than Steve's. I started using it, uh, I don't know, what, why, what, five years ago, six years ago, when we first started using it, um, and we had some things going down. I'm a horrible person. I don't have his data. I have pictures. Uh, Steve's a great data. Thank God he was a microbiologist, so otherwise we wouldn't have this information. Because what I did is that Mike's like, hey, what's going on over at your practice? I said, well, I'm cutting out an OR day. Steve tracked it. I mean, I have the same thing. I still take kids to the operating room, but all I do is children. So I have a lot of special needs adults and stuff. So we still, but we're down from doing one and a half days every week to doing one day, uh, every three days a week, three days a month. I mean, you know, so I go three times a month versus, do the math, eight, 12, what is that? I don't do math. I have a microbiologist that does that now. But <laughs> technically, I'm taking like nine kids a month to the operating room now versus where I, we were end up taking about 20 plus kids. So we've cut ours almost totally in half, and all I do is special needs kids and all that. So by allocating that time, I was able to get out of the get out of the OR. So same thing. Stress, low risk carries. These are the protocols that I use. Um, short versions of it. Um, low risk carries, that's your everyday kid that comes in, parents are all engaged, maybe they have fluoridated water, I mean, any of that. if you don't do dentistry, it's, your, it's the good kid. It's the kid with this picture in the pedo book. You know, it's got perfect teeth, and, you know, mom and dad are prevention people and all that. Not necessarily my organic friends uh, either on that, which is funny because for some reason organic sugar doesn't cause caries in some people's minds, which is interesting. Uh, I don't think the bacteria care, actually. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't met a smart bacterium yet, so. Uh, but oral hygiene brushing, you know, just keep them. This is your typical kid. Every six months they're coming in, they're just kind of, you don't have to expend a lot there. You're basically seeing the kid reinforcing behaviors. Moderate risk carries, and in moderate risk, um, Again, no offense to my, my brethren in the ADA and the AAPD and, and all of that, but we, we have a carries assessment model that's not, it's not good yet. It, it's, it puts too many people in moderate to severe carries due to socioeconomic status because uh, Dee noted that it's not the poverty that necessarily makes her bad teeth because some of the best teeth I have in my practice are my uh, Hispanic migrant kids that I, I work so I love them to death, and then some of the worst teeth, same ones, are next door neighbor. It depends on where they go and how quickly they got into the sugar. It's it's, it's about feeding the disease, um, not necessarily about the parents, whether they speak English or Hmong Chinese or Russian or however many people are in my practices. But it's not about that. But moderate carries risk. The kids aren't quite there with their hygiene. Their disease has begun. They have carious lesions at the beginnings of that. So when you do those, you have to jump in. So routine six month recall, there's a six month recall in kids. And adults, I won't make the argument because I don't do them. Children need to come in every six months. Something's changed every six months to me. Even on a low carries kid, you need to see them. Growth and development issues. Um, I think there's a pointer here, so I'm not really sure. Oh, there we go. Uh, 60 day interval out evaluations, fluoride varnish application each visit. So this can just be the routine everyday fluoride varnish that you hear about, Head Start programs, school programs. Uh, public health programs and stuff. You're always hearing about coming every three months to get a fluoride varnish, then maintenance with every six months. Those kids can kind of do okay with that. I add in, my big one that's different than Steve, I'm a xylitol guy. I, I, I love xylitol. Uh, I think it's as big a game changer maybe even uh, in a different fashion. It's the maintenance part of it. Um, the stuff works great. Um, you got to formulate it right. We're still figuring that out uh, and working with that. I think Joel can probably back me up. They found out that you can't mix xylitol in with certain products that are normally in toothpaste that are binding agents. For some reason, the xylitol doesn't work. So we're still working on that. But if you don't have xylitol, get some. Kind of like the old, for those of you who are from West Texas oil country like I was, if you don't have an oil well, get one. If you don't have xylitol, chew it. Get some, find the gum, Epic, Spry, X-Clear, your local naturopathic store, um, chew two pieces of the dentine or whatever it is that has it in it because it doesn't have enough in it, so you need to chew two or three pieces at a time. But get you some xylitol, 
everybody get on xylitol. It keeps your bacteria from clumping together. Basically, they don't stick, they don't eat, they don't eat, they don't damage, and therefore you don't have a problem there. Okay, so get some. Xylitol's a big thing. We put them on gel three times a day, and we follow them up every 90 days. Um, and if we see holes, then we do silver nitrate, silver fluoride application, depending on you know, where we're at. Right now, we're doing silver nitrate because we're still waiting on the FDA. Severe carriage risk, a little different. We don't remove this. We still see them. Plus, 30-day interval elevation. This is what I do in my protocol. We emphasize this at every visit. It's all about diet. It's all about cleaning the bacteria. We get them on the xylitol, and we push until we see no plaque. And you'll eventually see no plaque. It's pretty amazing. Uh, then we put them on varnish as necessary. And what I mean by that is that they have some primary lesions in there. If they're soft or they got white spots, I don't necessarily go in and treat just basic white spots with silver nitrate this time. I don't. I believe you do. White spots. So he does. And I and so I, re, I find that varnish works for me. So it, 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 it seems to remineralize them as long as I add in the xylitol for mine. Uh, but if they have a hole, bang. Just exactly what Steve. We've been doing the same thing there for, for years. So... Breakdown. So this is the part for those of you who are in uh, private practice and maybe looking at changing and how this will work. Because a lot of people that were widget driven and said we, we are really procedurally driven. That's why we have CPT codes and IDTC9 codes. Everybody has a code. If you're in mental health, you've got a whole compendium of codes that you have to do. That allows us to bill, which allows us to get paid. So what we're doing, the cost breakdown, it comes out to this. This is a basic and a pedo practice. It'll go up and down. Everybody can argue a facility cost. Uh, this is about what mine runs. It, uh, in, in doing that, runs about a buck a minute per operatory. So that's, that's my utilities and all that kind of stuff for the operatory. So how does that work when I get paid $9.86 a month? So to me, it's about not having to do much and whether or not I have a team that can do it in 10 minutes or a doctor that does it in 30. So even if I'm doing the prevention, this is kind of like worst case scenario. This is really so. If my staff took 30 minutes to clean a four-year-old's teeth, we'd have a new staff. So, uh, and and so worst case scenario though, I got somebody new. They're really slow. Kids hard to work on. This is what you get. You're going to spend about. Assistant's going to run you about $18 an hour, somewhere around that time frame. That'll vary between 15 and 22 bucks. So we take the middles, $18 an hour, 30-minute appointments, so nine bucks. Supply cost, disposables, around $6 for what they use to clean your teeth. It's just throwaway stuff. And maybe a little bit more depending on whether you use nitro gloves. I want to do the argument. But this is kind of based in the middle. Facility costs for 30 minutes, about 30 bucks for that chair. And then you're going to go back in and total visit costs about $47. Now the total per year that I'm going to get paid out here is about 94 bucks. So the difference that you're going to get in here total you took out the bottom of my slide <laughs> i just realized you cut oh would i have another one okay good i was going so this is cost per year per patient in a chair okay worst case scenario 94 bucks nine dollars and 86 oh you made it schmancy okay good that's it that's schmexy there do you see that thing spin that's pretty cool i'm a west texas boy anything it spins gets my attention i'm kind of like a squirrel on crack i'm an adhd guy so you get in here the cap payment 986 a month the base pay that we get Total received 118, annual cost 94. So this is molar math. So if anybody in here is a CPA and want to art, it's fine. I don't care. But I can tell you that even in a worst case scenario, I can clear about 24 bucks per patient. Now, that ain't a lot of money. You know, I mean, you divide that in, it's two dollars a month in profit per patient. You're going to get it. And people say, hmm. But if I can up my visits from 3,000 to 17,000 <coughs> times two bucks. So. Now you, now you have an access issue that you can do prevention on that makes it pay. Because now you're keeping it because you're not expending it. You throw one sedation in here and you're minus a thousand bucks. Just one. Because if you're in a capitation system and you've got to take a, a doctor who makes a, a little over a hundred dollars an hour plus two assistants, if you're going to do a sedation you have to have two because that's the rules. They're going to throw them in there for that same thing for an hour. Then you can see what your costs are just to work on a kid for 30 minutes. That alone eats your entire annual payment for that child. So that doesn't matter what you did in there. And then you start adding in the cost of a crown and all that. You can run out of money real quick. So the impetus on this is to prevent and to intervene early so that you can still realize what you're going to get down here. So I just wanted, I just throw that in there simply because a lot of people don't know how you can do it. I tell people I get paid basically 10 bucks a month. They're like, how in the world do you make money on that? Because I kill the disease early, I don't let it come back with silver nitrate, silver fluoride therapies, I keep it down with xylitol and fluoride, 
and then I manage out the restorative just like Steve did because I don't have to sedate a child to pick up a tiny burr, take a black lesion, clean it out 18 months later when the kid thinks it's cool to come to the dentist and squirt a little glass on them and then run my finger over it, zap it with a light for five seconds and then smooth it up because they think that tickles. And that really and truthfully what it's changed from. Heavy duty sedations, having to do pulps and crowns and rubber dams and mouth props, occasionally a papoose board along with medication. I come out, every one of these is a sedation. These little gray hairs in my beard. Um, it's the hardest thing that we do is sedate kids. It's the hardest thing, the most dangerous thing that I do as a pediatric dentist is put a child sedated. Operating room is safer to me, but it's tougher on their brains. But we try and avoid it. So that's kind of the basis of what we can do on that. It's good for kids. Why? Steve and I are very good with a syringe, but we don't have to poke them. And Reduce need for traumatic office-based care, like he said. Need to train new methods. You gotta think about population basics. You don't think about widgets. You don't think about the procedure. You think about the patient pool. And that's a big difference. Diagnosis and triage. Get your hot stuff up front, put a finger in the dye, pour water on the flames, whatever you wanna call it. And then you can get back to the basic care, which you can manage at a very, very low cost to your office and a very, very low stress to your lifestyle. And then alternative procedures, and that's what we talk about. That's the, the management of carry still. So back to the same thing. It's good for everybody. It's a win-win-win all the way across the board. The patients win, we win, we can conserve dollars for those patients that need to be heavy utilizers. You know, you've got a 32-year-old 400 pound autistic male that needs to go, which I have. You're not treating him except in the operating room. There's nothing I can do. So we have to go expend seven, eight thousand dollars just to check his teeth out. But if I can save that money by not taking three-year-olds that I can maintain and routinely manage for about eight bucks, that's a good trade-off. Because it does, I can treat a whole lot of kids for eight dollars and that saves the money for me to treat the kiddo that doesn't have a choice in life because he's medically fragile like the young lady. And then you gotta spend your money on your high utilizers because some of those are always gonna be out there. But in the private practice world, that's the thing that works. More importantly is it, it doesn't, I think it's done. This is what's happened in the Medicaid world, in the world in general. This is not to point fingers at anybody. This is just to show you the facts. This is capitation rates paid in Oregon. This is the client up here. This is what we're spending. This is what happens every year for hospital care. That's hospital care. You get down here at the yellow bars and the blue bars and all that, that's dental. And so dental has dropped consistently, so has family practice. So it's not just a dental issue. It's, it's a practice issue on medicine. Our, these are our prevention levels that are going down. And what we're doing is as your prevention level goes down, look how much your hospital skyrockets. And these are actual rates out of OHP. So as we're paying more and more of the cap dollars are going to the hospital, this is not the hospital's problem. This is due to attention down here. And it's the same thing. Dentistry's become more expensive because we have not been able to put the money where we need to, which is upstreaming it into prevention and things that work. So it becomes more expensive. We have great technologies to make up for your for problems that we didn't take care of. We have implants and all these fancy things. We can build your crown while you wait and have a latte, you know, and they're great. But it's a lot, it's very expensive to do. And so preventing it'll help. I think that's all I got. So quick quick study. This can be real, real quick. Sorry, we're running late, and we do want to have some discussion time. This is a major problem. Continues to be a major problem, particularly for certain populations. Our old strategy of you know, really pretending we understood it, could control it, blaming the victims—that's the favorite part. You know, blame the victims when it doesn't work. Uh, this is a failure. It's been a failure. I think that increasingly people are realizing this is not a strategy. Yeah, this gets a little tricky. Um, I think there are a lot of people who should have known better, a lot of real smart people, it's their job to be smart, and they have uncritically accepted the effectiveness of things that's not effective, that are not effective in high-risk populations. They just aren't. They aren't measuring them, they aren't worried about measuring them, they aren't effective. Talk to the people here from the Indian communities. We are beginning to change at the group I talked about, the Quest, we're beginning to try to look at how to measure some of these things that everybody knows are effective, they haven't been measured and they, aren't very effective. Here's one we haven't really talked about, but the, uh, Steve and, and Cal have mentioned it, that 
Um, everything's been about access to care, and, and as I said at the last meeting, we had this whole mess starts with Dr. Lindsay Robinson here, who gave me the podium about four years ago and has been suffering ever since. She'd had to listen to my presentations over and over. It was all about access to care. How do we get more dentists? This is within the Indian Health Service uh, travel program. How do we get more dentists, more hygienists, more buildings, access to care? And I came in and said, let's look at decreasing demand for care. I think we have the, the tools to do that now. I had a little trouble at the top. Initially, all these slides were the facts, and I realized that 90% you know, of them were my opinion rather than facts. So about halfway through, I moved, I, I moved to, to in my opinion. So there's a small amount of honesty in, in some of this. Um, this is kind of hard for me to take. In the last week, I've had people, um, dental directors at places with just desperate needs uh, children going to the hospital, you talk about you know, cow, you got you know, uh, gray hair in your beard from taking kids to the hospital. They got a stream from this reservation of cars going because there are no dentists there at the local facility can do the OR cases. Taking them for a four hour round trip to do OR, OR cases. Every week, stream of them, cavalcade of them, they're not interested in the death in protocol because it's not the standard of care. Um, I'm trying to <laughs> trying to get over that and finesse the situation, but that's uh, just the environment that we work in. Uh, this is not the answer. Everybody said it. Steve said it. Cal said this is not the answer. Uh, at best, this is a secondary prevention, the silver nitrate protocol. Okay, primary is a lot better, um, but this approach seems to be a vast improvement in arresting existing carries from anything that we've had before. Uh, I think it's safe. I call it Duffin Protocol because I first met Steve and got to call it something. I don't want to say silver nitrate followed by fluoride varnish two, four, eight, twelve weeks. You know, it's just I call it Duffin Protocol. So if it's if it works out fine, he's going to be famous. Otherwise, you're in trouble. Everybody's going to know. But <laughs> Duffin Protocol did not work. <laughs> I think it's safe. I'm convinced it's safe. I think I'm convinced it's good for kids, for the high risk kids. Uh, Kyle and Steve can talk to good for dentists. I don't care about that. They do okay. I'm, I've been a poorly paid pediatrician all my life, so I'm really not worried about the dentist. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I think it's good for the for the payers as well for the on the total cost. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> talk about Eastern Oregon Cowboys. One of the problems we have right now is, is, is fabulous, great people like Dr. Kyle House who are doing this but it's not keeping data because I've been trying to kind of coerce him, finesse a little bit, get into his office, see if he's got some data. Haven't been able to yet. I'm hoping this public embarrassment may get me in there. I only, only live about 15 minutes away. I bought him lunch one day. Still didn't get in there. But <laughs> if, if we don't have any data on this, then the people that are saying it's not the standard of care, well, I wasn't taught this in dental school. You know, I can't do What about my license? What about the state board? If we don't have any data, we're never going to get past that. Dr. Joel Berg in the back is, is uh, heading up a group to try to do a real proper controlled trial. Uh, this is one of those things that it takes probably some years to put together. You've got to find a lot of money. You've got to get the right people. Control trial can be done, should be done. I think Dr. Berg will get it done. But that's some years down the road. Um, in the meantime, we can do something that's uh, a, a non-controlled trial type of research and get some information. It seems like this Duffin Protocol is moving, expanding, regardless of whether we do the trial. And, and that's it. Thank you so much. I'm sorry we went too long. We did want to have a, a time for uh, questions and answers, and I'll wrap it up here. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm a lay person. I work for Teams International. We do a lot of dentistry work. And so uh, and, and I apologize in advance if this question will offend anybody, but I'm interested with, with the, uh, in the nature of the, you know, the, prevention and so on that you're uh, suggesting work so well um, seemed to me as a layperson that you know everybody would just want to accept it to uh, begin to use it and uh, I'm just wondering if you're getting active resistance from it as opposed to just people don't know about it and therefore aren't uh, you know aren't uh, committed to using it because it doesn't uh, fit with the standard protocol or if uh, in your profession uh, you actually getting uh, active resistance to it, and Dr. D suggested that you might be. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, and perhaps Marco and there's several people who can speak. Uh, Mike can speak to it. I'll I'll say I'm amazed how little resistance from patients and parents. They love it. Yeah. They understand it. 
The pushback is from the professor. We'll work on that. No. Sorry. This is from Mike Raj. Oh. I'm feeling the need to rope something here. Somebody run. So does everybody in the room know what a paradigm is? Yeah. Set of rules and regulations we all know as we've operated within. And, and the better we know the paradigm, the better we get at it, the better, more successful we are. And the higher you are in the paradigm, the more you have, you're at risk to lose. Uh, that's what we got going on. Because in, in, in a paradigm, sooner or later, a problem develops that all of us know what it is, and we have no clue on how to solve it. And that is, how do we take care of poor people who have decay, to have no resources? And so the people who resist us the most are the ones that are highest up and more skilled in the paradigm today, which I call the replacement restorative paradigm, which is we all drill fill and replace things. And one th I said in a panel discussion one time like this, if our only tools to drill, we'll always be looking for a hole. And so you put it in that perspective, those folks that are high up in the paradigm. I got the opportunity to speak at the uh, Dental Dean, the Western Society of Dental Deans, uh, and uh, board examiners in San Diego here a few, a couple, three summers ago, and the person who argued with me the most, because what I said is, in a, pop in, a, in a population whose disease is out of control and behaviors are out of control, the drill doesn't work, and therefore we have to have a new standard of care. And the guy who argued with me the most was an endodontist. He's the highest up in the profession. And so what we have is if I'm invested in the paradigm, I'm going I'm to have a tendency to resist new changes. you got to remember that the guy... The guy who told people, surgeons, you ought to wash your hands before you do surgery, died in the same asylum. They drove him crazy because he was outside the realm. And it's because it didn't fit the paradigm. So this is a new paradigm. So may I ask, in, in the interest of time, if your question can be one minute, and our response will try to be one minute. Okay, go. Yes. One minute. Uh, you're on the yeah. I, I worked in Steve's office for a couple days, and after I saw the amazing thing that this protocol did for these little kids, I started using it in my office, and it's been fabulous for adult root caries, and it just stops them cold, and especially around crown margins. It just stops it cold. But my question is, I can understand when you're being paid by a capitation service, but as far as fee-for-service, I'm a fee-for-service dentist, um, I, there's absolutely, I mean, we can't even charge for fluoride treatments for adults, so I don't see any way that we can make this cost effective for us. That's why the entire system needs to be changed. I know. So, my question is how do we change you the will system? Next question. Yes. Um, does the silver nitrate um, need to be re redone? Like, you know, if you have one ap application, like an adult carries on the root, when do you need to reapply? Is it it's never going to come back the decay? So we had to kind of learn this anecdotally, and um, I discovered through experience that one time didn't seem to work, and so we decided to repeat it to try to make sure that it was effective as killing all the bacteria. So we have the protocol now of apply silver nitrate at the exam appointment. This is a huge paradigm shift. Why wait for the next appointment, right? right. Treat when the patient is in the chair. Start treatment immediately. So uh, at exam, two, four, eight, and 12 weeks, we would treat the silver nitrate fluoride varnish. Okay, that's, uh, that's probably too much, but we don't know for sure. We need some more science. And we know that that arrests everything. So we do repeated treatments. What we'd like to do is find out exactly what is the minimum number of treatments. So we're, we're working on that answer. From the data that I extrapolated from the really awful spreadsheet that you saw Dr. Duffin had developed and had all of his data in, uh, we do are able to print out reports now from the access database. And we have a limited number, but uh, we have 100% arrest of all carious lesions in the seven children who had only three treatments. So as we get more data and as I finally insinuate myself into Dr. House's office and get some of his data, um, come back and ask them the same question. Uh, I've got a question about xylitol. The uh, manufacturers are suggesting that three months 
protocol, six to ten grams a day makes people carries free. Do you think that's true? And if so, for how long they make carries free? Should probably defer to Dr. Bird back there on that. Um, I don't think it makes you curious free. I think what it does is it alters your microflora. So you start a, you start addressing at the medical level. It's another medical <laughs> management tool versus a surgical intervention tool. Uh, what we have seen in those, and I'm sure Dee will follow you when he gets another one. I want to get into more of my data. But the uh, yeah. what we there's a there's a lot of research on xylitol that's out there, mm -hmm. and what it's showing is I don't see kids my high risk kids. And again, I'm only speaking to kids and high risk adults. I have. Uh, a lot of globally delayed adults in my, and we have taken to where we used to take them to the operating room every year just to clean their teeth because these are people who cannot brush their teeth due to behaviors. Um, so we started putting them on xylitol, and we've gotten to where those are, are down to where they don't have to go. I mean, so will it keep them carries free? Uh, not if they're abusive, I don't think. I think you can't overcome, you know, in some people you can't overcome stupidity. That's a very powerful force in the world. But in some people, you can't overcome their situation. You can control it and manage it. So in those kind of cases, I would think it's smaller. But I wouldn't call them carries free. And, and you have to do it. And Joe, correct me. Basically, Zalto loses effectiveness after, I mean, you quit. It's basically gone a couple of weeks. The, black, the bacteria start to go right back to their same bad behavior. So it is a constant. You have to use it. It's kind of like retainers and orthodontics. You know, where you retain them, you put the teeth, you get to go through work again. So that would be the biggest thing. Are you talking about gels or chewing gum? Yes, okay. I, I yes I do. I mean, for my for so especially and adults mints. and mints, they, it comes in so many different things. If you you look at uh, there's two major companies that are out there right now, uh, and I don't have stock in any of them, please. But they're Spry and Epic. They used to be partners. Now they have two together. Uh, you can pick and choose the one you like. On price model, they're about the same. They all use that exact same dosing. You use it three times a day. Make sure you get six to nine grams of it, and, and it'll it'll change. And the best way to do it is go back and do it yourself for about four days, and uh, then skip brushing between breakfast and dinner and do the lick test. Your teeth will still be slick. Now, then don't use it for about two days. You go right back to the fuzzy game. So it so probably is a good months. thing. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry, that wasn't sorry. about the Duffin protocol. So <laughs> Mark McIntyre, retired preventive dentist from San Francisco. Uh, on the line of do it while you have the patient there at the first appointment, if you think it works the first time, why don't you just put the glass on over on a thin like a ART or IRT, whatever the terms are. So you do covering your silver nitrate, you're putting fluoride in the preparation and outside the preparation, and you don't have a hole for Snickers. Or right, so Snickers. I think it's a matter of timing. Um, right now, I know that this protocol works, so I'm hesitant to change it until I have the same level of confidence, but I think we'll get to that point where we are reducing the number of applications and we're moving to the glass on or protective restoration or protective coating. In fact, the best ideal situation I can think of is to rest all lesions in a fissure system and put a glass on or sealant on top of it. Right now, that's where I think the best thing we can. Yeah, I had a question about um, any products out there that would be in the non-US marketplace that utilize silver nitrate in toothpaste or varnish, or has anybody looked at putting silver diamond fluoride in another delivery vehicle or silver nitrate? I don't think you can. I think it would, it's too hard on, uh, hard on soft tissues. Okay. okay yeah, I just it's, yeah, it's not no, good for soft It's a hard tissue medicament, not a okay. soft tissue medicament. Or just another letter. Have anybody looked at Someone that? Someone has suggested it's a good idea, though. We'll, we'll, we'll follow up on that. <laughs> and then I have another question about the capitation rate. How do you determine, how is the capitation rate determined in Oregon? Is it actuarial or? I mean, that's, that's an issue in California. I'll give it to Mike. You might need five or six. No, one minute. It's not high enough in California. It, like geographic managed care, it, it translates to $3 per patient per month to the provider, which is impossible. The state of Oregon passed a law that required that the um, the capitation rate had to be actuarially sound. Okay. okay, that passed uh, many, many years ago because the, the, the governor said, rather than ration in people, uh, or what we pay the providers is ration of procedures. And so part of the law was it had to be actuarially sound so the provider could participate. So we're fortunate in Oregon that we actually have 
actuarially sound capillaries, though they're not actuarially sound anymore, but they were at one time. <laughs> yeah, how often do they go through that process? Well, it's supposed to be annual, yeah. but the state has figured out how to avoid the law yeah. uh, on yeah. a pretty annual basis. Yeah. But we're still getting, uh, uh, the, the cap rate for dentistry for everything is $18, and it's how we break it up and where it goes, because you got to pay specialists when you need them, you got to have yeah. admin, all the stuff that goes with it. Well, you're one step ahead of us, so... Uh, Ian Schwartz uh, from uh, OHSU Community Dentistry. Uh, it was asked, how do you change a paradigm in dentistry? And how would you introduce the Duffin Protocol or something similar uh, to a profession that is very uh, resistant to change? Um, I think there is really no way about actually having some proper data that can actually prove to the community and to uh, academic, the academic community, that this is a methodology that is actually uh, more um, uh, beneficial than the ones we use at the moment. It took a long time, for instance, for Fisher sealants to be accepted by the dental community. It was a very complex um, situation which included uh, insurance payments and uh, dentists accepting the notion that this would actually uh, do what it was supposed to do and so on. Um, I don't doubt that this protocol actually works. But what am I going to show to my students when we run our evidence-based dentistry program for the students that are coming in to dental school now? I cannot show them the data that I would, well, I can show you, you know, some of these curves, but if they ask me, was this a randomized clinical trial, I would say, no, it was not a randomized clinical trial. There may be other ways we can do it. Demonstration trials would be fine. And I think it would be wonderful if we could get at least the guys who are sitting around the table now and, and us to actually try and pull these data and actually get something sensible out of them and then maybe get it uh, to a level where it would be accepted as a publication. At the moment, most of the publications are on silver diamine fluoride. There's been publications about that for the last, since 2002, in general dental research and other places. And I think those are very convincing in terms of what it can do. And silver nitrate with fluoride varnish would probably do exactly the same. Yeah, but the, right. we need to have some proper um, studies and data. No way about it. Yeah. And, and Dr. Berg in the back can speak to this, but as part of the follow up of the symposium, the one with the beautiful orange cover on it there. Uh, we came up with a work, one of the four work groups was looking at new products. And uh, Dr. Berg is on that work group. Dr. Fred Eichmiller is, is heading it up as a leader. And as of the last two or three days, there's been this flurry of emails back and forth addressing the exact same question that you're talking about. It's how can we get something out of what's going on now without waiting for Dr. Berg's clinical trial, control trial in the next two or three years? Joel, will you speak to that, please? There's another microphone that you can I had to come to Portland to find out that Dr. Schwartz is in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, get, I only have one minute. It's going to be tough. But, uh, you, got, you got more. You're, 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 rather than ADA, you got two minutes. Put Kyle down there. Okay. I agree with, about the data, and I think the question that somebody asked before, I believe uh, you asked about the resistance. Is there resistance? I think it's under, but I, I'm not surprised it's resistance because we are a surgical discipline. It's about reimbursement, it's about history, it's about the kind of people that come into our profession. It's about a lot of things. Uh, and I, but I also agree that data is extremely important. So rather than fight the resistance, I think, I think to fight it too much, then it appears too much like not science, more religion. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is. I, I believe it works too. I mean, to me, I'm convinced when we use it. But I don't want to, the difference between evidence and no evidence is not that anecdote means it doesn't work, it just means I can't prove that it works, it's not predictable that it would work. Uh, to explain what, we're, what we talked about in the group uh, that, that has been described by Dee, uh, I, I, I think this is additionally important that we should also coalesce in a more profound way the data that has been collected in some kind of systematic review approach, you know, to analyze, kind of sew together, thread together all the different studies, and I think that Epidemiologists can do that, so that's one thing. But the, but the, the difference between this study and the sealant studies you described is that with the sealant, you have a choice to do it or not right now. 
In this case, there are kids in operating rooms, as the, the New York Times reporter who came to interview me for that story, she spent a day with me, and we had a long time to discuss this problem. And, uh, you know, the, the average wait time in academic health centers for, like, Boston Children's Hospitals, where the study began, this analysis began of the wait time for ORs, it may be worse than some Indian health center hospitals. The average is about seven months to get into the OR, okay? We're going to up our OR case rate at our clinic. We just built a new surgery center. We'll be doing about 30 a week. That's just the healthy kids. In addition to the special needs kids in the hospital, another 25 or 30 per week. And our wait time keeps going up even though we build more ORs, as was described earlier. So the opportunity that presents is because we have this wait time, we have no choice. We can't treat them now. We have to wait. So we have a chance to randomize patients into, because they're going to wait anyway, into this treatment. So it becomes an ethical way of managing in light of people who could say, well, how could you do that? It's not the standard of care. And the term standard of care, actually, I just want to comment on that in another 30 seconds, is that, <laughs> I told you I couldn't talk for a minute, <laughs> is that uh, standard of care means, it's, it's a legal term, and it means nothing more than the prevalent practice in the community. It is not about evidence. It's the prevalent practice. This may have more evidence eventually, but if it doesn't become the prevalent practice, ironically, it's not the standard of care. And when it comes to defending something legally, not, not that evidence isn't important, but <laughs> legally, the standard of care becomes more important. But, but I think we have an opportunity to do that study because of that wait time. It makes it the perfect scenario to do the study. And yes, it is expensive, and yes, I think we'll do it. I think we'll get the money somewhere. People are being educated. And I think that if we approach it properly, there won't be the resistance because it, because it makes sense. And I think if, if it's approached always from an evidence-gathering perspective, and not that, hey, it works, I believe it works, and I'm going to keep doing it. You know what I mean? I believe it works, but I don't want to approach that, that way from the public promotion standpoint because it has the appearance of a religion more than research. I, I don't want it to be that way. I want it to be research and evidence-based. Does that make sense? I'm delighted that Joel's here today and has this level of interest because it's this help that is going to get us like, where, where we need to be. The evidence has got to catch up with the practice, and I am confident of what I have to rest my case with what I said earlier. The higher up the pole, the more resistance there is. We got to have evidence to make it work. If some of us would have waited for evidence, it wouldn't happen. We wouldn't be taking care of 200,000 people with the, with the amount of money that we get. So if we'd have waited for the evidence, we had all the experts figured it out and all that kind of stuff. That's to prove to the dentist to make sure it's acceptable. But uh, sometimes, I mean, I, I just rest my case on that. Thanks, Mike. One more, one more comment to, relate to what I just heard. About 20 years or 15 years ago, I made a presentation to the University of California, San Francisco Public Health Group on a similar procedure. And I, was, I said, I can't do the study. Why don't you do the study? I mean, that's what you do, studies. And they said, well, it won't pass the ethics committee. I mean, there's always a reason, and th th there's always a resistance, even among people who are researchers, and people who are the public health dentists. So you have to, this kind of symposium is a, a start, but you have to realize that way down deep inside, people are resistant <laughs> to change. And it's very difficult, unless you know somebody or can do something. The one thing that I know is constant in life is change. Change will come if we wait for it, okay? We have the opportunity to tip change in the right direction. That's the key here. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. <laughs> this is a clinical question for private practice. Um, we have clusal caries nearly under control with sealants and uh, so the type of decay that we see are incipients of uh, interprotonal decay. So can uh, your, your protocol um, take care of that situation if it's not openly, the decay is open? You so can't access We didn't the discuss the technical details, but yes, we can open the contact with a wedge, simulant, as long as the silver nitrate gets access to the lesion, it works. We've seen arrested interproximal lesions, yes. You, you, just as another hint, you can use floss, believe it or not. 
We'll uh, little micro little flossers, dip it in it, take it in between the teeth, and it'll also help arrest the carrier. You can also use uh, 330, go in a proximal, but stay in enamel, put the silver nitrate and cure it, and activate the silver nitrate, and then you can remove the decay or uh, do the triage. 75 seconds. <laughs> um, you're the one that asked me to come here and talk. I was yes, resisting. <laughs> um, I read a book uh, about six months ago that maybe some of you read that I think it's perfect for this discussion about the industry change. And that's what we're talking about here, which has been a subject of my interest for many years. And I've noticed since 10 years ago when I started lecturing on caries management before silver nitrate was even discussed, the audience would trickle in, a few people would come, they'd all come to my restorative lecture. Now I still offer my lecture of restorative and caries management. Now the restorative is tended, but the caries management is overflowing. So I, I've seen, you know, there's a, there's a change in the community, there's a strong interest. But what I wanted to mention was, there's a book that I read a couple years ago, maybe some of you read it, and I urge you to read it, uh, called The Emperor of All Maladies. Have you read it? It was the New York Times bestseller in 2010, written by an oncologist, I can't pronounce his last name. Um, he's, um, anyway, he was an oncologist, he's an oncologist currently at Columbia University, trained at uh, Boston Children's, I'm sorry, not at Harvard, at Farber. And he talks, it's a fascinating book, you learn a lot about cancer, it's the biography of cancer, of the disease historically, he goes back thousands of years, he talks about it the last hundred years, and mostly the last 20, 30 years, and then going into the future. And it's striking how he describes it as eerily similar to what we feel is going on. We talked about today in dentistry. He talks about how the surgeons ruled. And when the chemotherapists began to provide data, even with data, they were ostracized. Farber, now the Dana Farber Institute, was, he was a pathologist. He was put in a closet in the corner of the basement of the hospital because they, they thought it was kind of heresy that he was using some kind of chemical to treat what is managed surgically. And it's eerily similar to what we're talking about here. It's an outstanding book. It's, it's the best book I've ever read. And it'll bring you close to home, but it, it brings light at the end of the tunnel. Because now surgery is secondary to chemotherapy. In the future, it's gene therapy. But it's a very really interesting book I urge you to read. Thank you, the Emperor of All Maladies. <laughs> We have about five, five or ten more minutes. Just a quick question. I have a, um, seems like aesthetics could be a big issue possibly for some people. And I guess um, I just wonder if it does the silver nitrate only adhere to carious areas or um, if you were to touch an area of solid tooth structure, would it also discolor? Very um, important question. Silver nitrate does not appear to have any effect on healthy enamel whatsoever. Only on carries it now. In fact, it's like a carries detector. <laughs> it's great. What about caustic? Oh, and, and so what happens if you touch soft tissue? Silver nitrate is very caustic, okay? If you get a little bit on your gums or your gingiva, I did this on myself. <laughs> yes, you'll get a little brown spot and it'll be gone in two weeks, okay? If you get a little bit on your hands, I uh, unfortunately opened a bottle without gloves on. I have a great slide, okay? It lasted two weeks, it's gone. <laughs> and emphasis on eyewear protection. This is absolutely crucial. When you're using silver nitrate, eyewear protection is, is, this is where the damage could happen. Getting a drop of silver nitrate in the eye could cause a serious damage. So that's the one thing that we emphasize. Yes. Uh, I have a grandson who's disabled and he has one of those little tubes that you put the blood and you're feeding through. They treat it to keep the infection down with silver nitrate. Yeah. There you go. Sure. sure. Quick question. Can I hear a little bit from the dental hygienist on the panel? Um, what have you been doing, your procedures? Are you using two-handed or four-handed hygiene when you apply the silver nitrate? So mainly what I've done is gone around and trained um, our clinic staff and get the follow-up questions and see what they experience. Um, as a hygienist, I usually never have an assistant. I feel like when I have an assistant, they're in my way, so it's me by myself. And I actually applied it interproximal the first time. Um, was my first patient with silver nitrate was interproximal. So um, I do it by myself. And just the same way I would do sealants. Who was your patient, Charity? Um, it was my son. He 